once around Gliese 229. So Gliese 229 is a faint red star just on the border of the constellation of Lepus the Hare. From my point of view, that's below Orion in the winter sky. Of course, I'm in Cambridge in the UK in the Northern Hemisphere. So if you're in the South, it'll be the other way up. Magnitude 8. So you can't see it with the naked eye. In fact, we can't see any red dwarf stars with the naked eye. But you will be able to find it with binoculars or a small telescope using the star map. Just star hop your way along. And it's one of the sun's near neighbours at just under 19 light years away from Sol. Physically, it's a red dwarf, class M1. The M class stars are known as red dwarfs and that runs from the brightest at M0 through to M9. So class M1 is at the upper brightness end. It's 58% the mass of our sun, so getting on for two thirds of the mass and just 55% of the radius. Quite big for a red dwarf. Some of them are as small as 7.5% the mass of the sun and uh, maybe 10%, that sort of range, not uncommon. And actually, this one's relatively young. It's half the age of the sun, just 2.5 billion years. And red dwarfs have a reputation for a lot of flares. But this one, it does have flares, but they're relatively calmed down now. After 2.5 billion years, these red dwarf stars do seem to uh, produce fewer flares. The majority are in the first few hundred million years of their existence. And the interesting thing about Gliese 229 is really the discovery of its companion, 229b. In 1994, astronomers from Caltech and the Johns Hopkins University used the Palomar telescopes and detected a companion which was then followed up a year later by the Hubble Space Telescope. And we have the two images on the right hand side here. The Paloma image showing that blob just at the limb of the star there and Hubble showing a rather better resolution, picking it out in more detail. Now this is an object that is orbiting around the main star in a period of 350 years. So what do we know about it? Well, from these initial measurements and trying to get spectra of the uh, surface from the light reflected from the primary, we were able to determine that there was methane in the atmosphere. And methane in the atmosphere is typical of things like Jupiter, gas giant planets, but you don't tend to find it in the atmospheres, the outer layers of stars. So this is not a star. Um, and is perhaps a giant planet, or more likely a brown dwarf. And as a brown dwarf, this was one of the first such objects to be discovered. Now, brown dwarfs are objects between gas giants and stars themselves, and we class anything from 13 to 75 times the mass of Jupiter as a brown dwarf. And the difference between a giant planet and a brown dwarf is that inside these larger objects, the temperature can get quite considerable in the core. And if it reaches 1 million Kelvin, that's not enough to kick off normal hydrogen fusion. That would uh, require around 10 million. And if you kick off normal hydrogen fusion, then you're a star and anything over 75 times the mass of Jupiter will be able to do that and would be a red dwarf star at that point. But at a million Kelvin, you can do another nuclear reaction, which is to take deuterium, the nucleus of heavy hydrogen, with one proton and one neutron, and smash it together with ordinary hydrogen, just protons, and create helium-3. That's the normal second stage reaction that occurs in the proton-proton chain that turns hydrogen to helium. But 
although you can't do the first stage, the proton plus proton reaction to make deuterium, if you start with any deuterium, then you can fuse it. That second step is actually easier to carry out, requiring a lower temperature. The problem is that deuterium is very rare. There are only a few hundred parts per million of deuterium around in typical astronomical objects. And so you very rapidly consume it all, turning the deuterium into helium-3 and you run out of fuel. So you get a pulse of heat in the center of these objects after they've formed. And then that heat gradually dissipates and they begin to cool. So Gliese 229b enabled us to calculate from that 350 year orbit and from the, the uh, radius of the orbit, you can use Kepler's laws to calculate the mass of the primary, but you can't from that calculate the mass of the brown dwarf in itself. Estimates based on size, brightness, thermal radiation, a whole series of different methods concluded that it was quite massive. And the estimate was 71.4 times the mass of Jupiter. Now that's near the upper end of the mass scale for brown dwarfs, just about as heavy as they can get. But curiously, the temperature is only 950 Kelvin. And you would expect a very large brown dwarf to have perhaps heated up to 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, even 2,500 Kelvin. And so this suggests that either it's very, very old indeed and has consumed all the deuterium and done all its nuclear reactions and then cooled all the way down to 950, or that we've got the mass wrong and that the mass should be cooler. Uh, sorry, the mass should be less in order for it to be this cooler temperature. So something doesn't seem to quite fit. But recently, the VLT, very large telescope, in fact, four very large telescopes working together as an interferometer, were able to have a good look at what was going on with 229b and determined from the images they were able to construct and from looking at the radial velocity with the uh, spectrometer, the SL spectrometer, they were able to determine that we're dealing with two objects, 229BA and 229BB. And the uh, radial velocity was able to tell us that these two objects are in orbit round each other as a binary brown dwarf pair. They go round in a period of 12 days, just 0.04 astronomical units apart. So we haven't got an image of these two separately yet, uh, but I think that will become possible as technology continues to improve. And what we were able to determine from all of this, from Kepler's laws again, that we have two objects, one with 38 Jupiter masses, temperature 900 Kelvin, and one with slightly less, 34 Jupiter masses at 775. Now that makes sense of the mass temperature relationship. These objects being smaller will have uh, been able to carry out less fusion and had less deuterium in the first place. And so have ended up at this cooler temperature. And we haven't got one single 70 something mass, uh, Jupiter mass object uh, with a curiously low temperature. So this makes sense of the problem. Now, in terms of planets rather than brown dwarfs, there have been two possible detections of planets around the main star, Gliese 229, capital A, and these would be 229AB and 229AC, the first one being a super Neptune and the second one being a super Earth. So I would have thought a super Neptune is probably really better described as a Saturn, perhaps, 
but um, we seem to use the term Super Neptune for these. I guess it's because we don't want to imply that they have rings if we don't know that that's true. And for the Super Earth, again, slightly larger and probably rocky planet bigger than Earth, and it happens that this one is in the habitable zone, not too close, not too far away, just at the right sort of temperature for a rocky planet to have uh, liquid water on its surface. And that sounds fantastic, but as it says on the screen, the most recent studies can't reproduce this. So it looks like these might not exist at all. And I await further results really to find out whether this interesting uh, stellar combination with a red dwarf and a pair of brown dwarfs has any further companions. Yeah. So that's it. That's the story of Gliese 229 and its friends. I hope you've enjoyed that. And thanks very much for listening.